This is uh, Growing Up Aspen season two, where we're actually gonna deep dive with a bunch of folks that we actually grew up with. Usually it's Chris Pomeroy and myself, Andy Collin, but today it's just Mike Merolt and I. And um, let's just say when I moved into town, the Merolt name was sort of, sort of fixated into the Aspen community as a pillar. And so I'm actually honored to be able to get another Marolt in our in our on our podcast. And um, one of the things that I was excited to try to do is, you know, everybody, we don't really know where we all go and where we all do as yeah. we're in high school in Aspen and sitting in the comments, you know, looking at each other. <laughs> and where are we going to go and what do we do? And I feel like it's interesting because. Some folks sticked around, stuck around. Some folks didn't. Even the yeah. folks that stuck around did lots of interesting stuff. I mean, the Tashes have continued their coaching Olympic type skiing stuff. Um, you know, even folks like Andy Mill, who I talked to, who in our world was known as the skier, he's yeah. like, well, I'm real more famous for fishing now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. So yeah, I, um, I hear you. I, yeah, I feel like it's interesting to sort of hear the stories of, you know, I mean, we all know where we came from, but to sort of see where we went with what we got, you know? Yeah. And your story is an interesting one. Um, I know I got to hear it a little bit on that on that thing, but I feel like it'd be great to hear for some of the folks that are reading my book to sort of get a feel of who you guys are. You and your brother were, you know, sort of an effect for a lot of kids because of the little league but um yeah you know so uh what what i i would i would say for me the first time i noticed since you're outdoor mountaineer guy um i would say that one of the first things for me that was my experience was seventh grade and eighth grade outdoor ed and I felt like in Aspen, that was a staple for a lot of people. And I keep hearing them, oh, we're going to take it away. Oh, we're, you know, all this kind of yeah. stuff. And I'm like, wow, that is amazing because that's the one thing that was so important in my life. How did that affect you? Well, I, you know, I think that dad started us out in the backcountry at age 12. I think it was 1975. And he, Came to the, we were at the dinner table. I'll never forget it. And he said, "Guys, why don't you?" It was July, Ju, July third. Yeah. And he said, "Why don't you go throw your ski gear in the back of the car?" And you know, we're coming off the baseball field and the golf course, and it's eighty degrees, and we just thought it was nuts. And and but you know, we idolized Dad, and and so we we did what we were told, and we went up to the Fourth of July Bowl east of Aspen. And that's really where the seeds of my passion were planted. And so for a lot of years, I'd go out with my buddies with, you know, the Callahan brothers and and uh, Jim Gow wasn't really part of it uh, at that point. And Roger and Steve and my dad. And we would we just fell in love with that kind of skiing. And I can remember being up there the first time and it was like, whoa, this yeah. is really incredible. And it's coupled with a. Uh, Another kind of interesting thing that happened to us when we were in kindergarten, you know, this was before we could read. My dad, through his ski racing, was close with Jim Whitaker, and Jim Whitaker was the first American to climb Mount Everest. And and Jim sent him a copy of the book, Americans on Everest. And even before we could read, I mean, we've got that book and it's so tattered. We would just stare at the pictures. <laughs> and 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 it was the color. I'll never forget the yellows and the blues of their equipment. And and uh, when we got up and the sun came above the horizon on Independence Pass that day, that was really the first time that I could understand a, a, a little bit about what those pictures were all about. But for years, we would head out with Dad. And then when we were older, you know, we we dad had fixed up an old jeep and we could take that but for years and years it was just our alpine gear and and we didn't have we didn't use any ropes we didn't have any of the equipment or anything and and we didn't know rope handling whatsoever so 
when eighth grade outdoor ed rolled around, it was the same incredible experience that all kids have. But for us, it added another, you know, arrow in the quiver, so to speak, of, of something that we could take with us eventually. And we really started to practice rope handling and, and we, we fell in love with rock climbing. I mean, you got to remember back then, you know, we didn't have the arc, we didn't have climbing gyms, we didn't have climbing right. walls. And yeah. so for kids at that age to get out there and experience rock climbing, that was that was a pretty special deal. And to, you know, back yourself off that high rappel, I mean, it, it was, for us, the lights went on and it was like, we paid attention because I can remember uh, Kilman was, was belaying me up a, a little rock face and I thought, someday I'm gonna need this. I need to really pay attention. So it had an added element of, of gear and technique to this passion that was sown a few years earlier when we were starting to, you know, hike for our skiing. And, and, and then everything from there just started to evolve. Right. You know, the gear, the, the harnesses, the crampons, helmets, you know, Callahan, Callahan's dad was a member of Mountain Rescue and, and he brought out all of the gear and, you know, from the time that I saw crampons and a helmet and an ice axe and all that kind of stuff that he had for his missions with Mountain Rescue, it, it, it became a, a, a goal to attain that stuff. And I can remember going in and BSing with with uh, Mr. Graywall at Sherpa Sports because yeah. he not only sold bike stuff, he sold climbing stuff. And then Lidner uh, had, a, had a shop. What was his shop called in Aspen over on the mall? I can't remember, but he was a European based in Aspen and he was our neighbor and oh. he sold a lot of climbing gear. You know, this is before the Ute and before everything. Right. right. And so we would get summer jobs and we would just buy this piece of gear or that piece. I remember the first time I bought a carabiner. I mean, I carried that thing on my belt loop forever. But yeah, eighth grade outdoor ed had an enormous uh, impact on us, as did all the teachers, because, you know, uh, Griff Smith and Scott Edmondson, and uh, I know I'm forgetting some of them, but uh, Plan, Mike, Plan. those guys in the summer would immediately take off for places like Alaska and Bolivia. Yeah. And so the, 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 we just kind of saw, had all of this information and we were learning skills. And, and, and before we knew it, you know, we were watching their slideshows and, and those guys became mentors. And so, and they were the guys that were running eighth grade outdoor ed. So it had yeah. a little bit different direction, a little bit different impact on us than a lot of kids. But there were a lot of other kids that took advantage of it as well. You know, the, the Willies uh, got into uh, mountaineering and and Neil Beidelman. And I mean, you can go down the list and they, well, they all have the same story. Eighth grade outdoor ed was fundamental. Yeah, it felt like to me, there was always sort of generations. In other words, there was the older generation like Raul, and then there was yeah. your generation. And my generation was Pierre and Todd yeah. Stone and Craig Melville and those guys. And so it felt like there was always sort of a group, a small group, but there was always a little group that always kind of fit underneath the next guys, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it was just putting the pieces together and just progressing, you know, at, at a comfortable rate. Wow, so what, I mean, it, um, what, I would say the closest thing I experienced to some of the stuff was when I went skiing at Whistler because the clouds would come in on Whistler and then you'd go up through the clouds and get up and it would be totally clear day. And so yeah. you're way up on the top up there, skiing the bulls and up there and looking around and all you could see are the peaks poking out of the clouds. So it felt like you were with the gods in a way, like you're yeah. up there skiing with the gods because all you see is white clouds down below. <laughs> and I would imagine that that's sort of some of that thing that keeps calling you back up there is that when you're up there, there's sort of that magical presence that you're on top of the world. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, you know, one of the large pieces for me, and it's it's something that I recommend to all people getting into this, is you can go to the bookshop 
and there are hundreds of mountaineering books. And, and I gravitated towards those books. And later in life, I, I realized that there was a definitive benefit to that. You got to experience all the excitement vicariously, both good and bad. And, and, and the issue that, that the, the issue that was solved with a lot of it was, you, you know, with the exception of my books, all those books are epics. You know, epics, people want to read about epics. People want to read about harrowing stuff. They want to read about people surviving. And I'm no different than anyone. And 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 I, I can't tell you how many times I've been out in the backcountry and I refer back to when people made mistakes in those books. And, and, and I could see not only how to avoid them, but, you know, having been in a couple of situations myself you know how to how to deal with it and and um so it it it, it really i mean the first the first book that i wrote was natural progression and it, it it talks about our history and it talks about you know what you have to kind of think what would draw somebody starting at you know whatever age you are in eighth grade what what really draws people to the to the mountains to go back over and over and over and and there is a th there is something that has attributed to all those books being written and and so you know you you, you couple it with your own experience here in the elks which are just so accessible to you know the experiences the the beautiful experiences that people have in those books and it, it creates an environment out there where I think the reason that people are are attracted to the mountains because they have been for thousands of years. Um, th th there, there's a, a sense of of peace out there, but there's also a sense of humility, and and it it it, it breeds a, a spiritual awareness that there's something else going on, and that there's a, a whole gigantic world that when you get off the beaten path and you get up in. To those mountains that just humbles you and makes you realize that I'm not in control of as much as as, right. as I thought. And I think that you know when you look at it from a spiritual point of view, I mean, you know, Mount Olympus. You know, right. The, right. The, they went to Mount Olympus to to seek clarity. I mean, Jesus often, you know, in the Bible is reported to have gone to the mountains. Moses, you know, he right. went to the mountains. Right. And and there's a reason for that. And I think that, you know, from a practical point of view, there's just not a lot of distractions up there. It allows you to really become aware of who you are and where you are and what you're doing. And 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 that's that's that humbles you. Yeah, you, you know. And 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 then as we progressed and got into some of these more exotic peaks and places in South America and Asia, it just takes it to a whole nother level. You know, you're out there with a backpack full of gear and that's it. Right. And 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 there's something very satisfying and very peaceful about doing that. So it it it, it grabs a hold of you and there's ebbs and flows in people's desires and 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 I think that for the handful of people that choose to you know, I mean, for lack of better description, make it a career of sorts. Yeah. You go through those ebbs and flows and, and it, it gets the, the, the deeper you get into it, the, the more discomfort you experience. You know, it's one thing to know you're going to be out there pushing yourself to climb a 14 or in the elk range versus, you know, you're going to be out there for a month trying to scale you know, the North Ridge of Mount Everest or something. And and so there's 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 growth and, and in that process, that discomfort is really a governor that prevents a lot of people from wanting to go back and do it because it is dis discomfort. It is uncomfortable, it is scary. And and I think that if you hang in there long enough, you get little bits of satisfaction even within the misery that comes with climbing. I mean, Reinhold Messner said, if you find somebody that tells you they enjoy climbing an 8,000 meter peak, 
you're looking at the face of a liar because it's not comfortable. <laughs> it's satisfying, but it's not necessarily fun. And, and the more you do it, that satisfaction starts to take over and you get past those hurdles. So you would get you ask the hurdles that prevent people from from going back for for more? But initially, you know, especially for for people that get into it around here in Aspen, it's just pure fun. It you get all the benefits. I I and, kind of see you it get to go home and sleep in your bed. It's interesting because I kind of see it as that sort of meditation, the next stage. In other words, when you start to apply stuff, and it feels to me like the journey for you is the. Um, it's not just getting to the top of the peak. It's the whole thing. And well, the whole journey has different parts and pieces that you pull from. So it isn't just one thing. It's the whole adventure. It, it is. It really is. You know, that's where the saying comes from. It's about the journey, not the summit. Right. But but even within the confines of that, it's, it's really funny. I have my second book out on Shishapangma. And I, I go to do these book signings and John Wilcox, another local at yeah. American Adventure Production, he actually talked us into sending a film crew to film that. And, and, and I go into that in the book, but, you know, we were not too keen on, on having a, a film crew, but they came and, and it served the purpose because we didn't have enough money to do the trip and, you know, right. that paid for it. But in that film, it's just it's almost embarrassing. I mean, I'm sitting in this bus and we're, you know, trying to get around a, a car accident on this high mountain dirt road. And, and I actually say, God, it would be so awesome if you had these peaks in Colorado and you didn't have to go through all the third world discomfort and nonsense and you could just go climb and <laughs> ski. And, and the irony of that is that, that I was really young when I said that. Yeah. Now, the bigger draw for me is all of the, the 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 difficulties just getting to the peak. I still love climbing and skiing, but I love going to those cultures where you're you're uncomfortable and it's just so the opposite of what we're used to here in 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 America. And that has become more of the draw for me, just being in the culture, meeting those those people, seeing how they live that's as, as big a draw for me as the climbing and the skiing. So I went a total 180 degree change in my development as a climber. And that's kind of what I'm talking about here. It's the more you do it, the more you appreciate it. And, 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 you know, you're going to have to get over these mental and comfort comfort hurdles that prevent a lot of people from doing it. Like we do it. Some people think we're crazy, but it's it's our little secret. It's like <laughs> the journey is it's all about the journey. Thanks for listening to Growing Up Aspen, a joiner's table podcast with our classmates. Um, we'd like to thank uh, the Aspen Times and the Aspen Daily News for letting us uh, include some of their materials in our book, Growing Up Aspen, Adventures of the Unsupervised. The authors would like to thank you. If you're interested, you can check out our book at uh, twistandturnpress.com.